We are at a pivotal time, navigating a world that is increasingly filled with peril. Ongoing conflicts show no sign of abating, divisions are running deeper than ever, and humanity's value for one another seems to be at an all-time low. It is at this time that the Peace Symposium hosted by the Ahmadiyya Muslim community serves as a critical platform for hope, understanding and collaborating towards a future of harmony and peace. This symposium is a beacon of hope, a call to come together. At the heart of these events are the inspirational guidance of Hazrat Mizra Masur Ahmad, may Allah be his helper, the fifth caliph of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, who for the past 20 years has spoken of the vital importance of justice, peace and respect among communities worldwide. His messages, filled with wisdom and foresight, urge us toward a path of empathy and unity, highlighting the gentle power of compassion in preventing the discord that threatens our global family. This symposium being held at the Batafu Mosque in London and its theme for this year, Building a Sustainable Peace, represents more than a meeting of minds. It's a collective commitment towards building bridges, engaging in meaningful dialogue and to committing to a future where peace is not just an ideal but to live reality for all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Battle for Two Mosque and to the National Peace Symposium. We will now start the formal proceedings and we will start with the recitation of the Holy Quran in Arabic. And I would like to request Mr. Nafis Ahmed Kamar to deliver the recitation, followed by the translation in English by Hazim Ahmed Arif. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا ولو على أنفسكم أو الوالدين والأقربين إن يكن غنيا أو فقيرا فالله أولى بهما فلا تتبعوا الهوى أن تعدلوا وإن تلووا أو تعرضوا فإن الله كان بما تعملوا خبيرا <تصفيق> بسم 
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and blessings of God be upon you all. The verse recited before you today has been taken from chapter 4, verse 136 of the Holy Quran. The English translation is as follows I seek refuge with Allah from Satan the accursed, in the name of Allah, the gracious, the merciful. O ye who believe, be strict in observing justice and be witnesses for Allah, even though it be against yourselves or against your parents and kindred. Whether he against whom witness is born, be rich or poor, Allah is more regardful of them both than you are. Therefore, follow not your low desires that you may be able to act equitably. And if you hide the truth or evade it, then remember that Allah is all aware of what you do. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have our first speaker, and I invite the national president of the MDM Muslim Community UK, Mr. Rafi Kayat, to give the welcome address. <clears throat> Beloved Hazur, respected guests, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May peace and blessings of Allah be upon you all. I'm delighted to welcome you to the 18th National Peace Symposium of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community, UK. As you will no doubt be aware that this year's event is being held at a time of great significance due to the raging conflicts around the world. It is deeply distressing that last year's, events, last year's event was held as the Russia-Ukraine war was raging and sadly, not only is that still the case, but it has been added to by horrific situation in Israel and Palestine. The horrific acts of October the 7th have been compounded by the onslaught of people of Gaza. The conflict has seen nearly 30,000 people killed, mostly women and children. And we are witnessing unbearable scenes on our screens of innocent children been killed by the bombing. We must stop the suffering and have an immediate ceasefire so that the killing stops, hostages are released, and people can get food, water, and medicine to give them a chance of survival. His Holiness has repeatedly warned for the past two decades that there's growing risk of national and regional conflicts spreading and engulfing the entire world in a devastating nuclear conflict. We have unfortunately witnessed the risk growing ever more acute, and talk of a third world war is sadly now a commonplace. It is now more than ever that the world needs principal leadership for the global peace, and the events today focus on that, to seek how we can build a sustainable peace so that it is not just for today, but for the future too. In this regard, we're deeply honored that His Holiness, Hazrat Mizam Masur Ahmed, may Allah be his helper, the fifth caliph, and the worldwide head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is with us this evening. He has consistently raised his voice for peace in parliaments across the world, including the UK, EU, Capitol Hill, and in Holland, New Zealand, as well as numerous other forums. His Holiness is a champion for the cause of peace and works tirelessly for this objective and for the sake of humanity. I think we can all agree that in these times, there can be no greater objective. So I again thank you all for being with us today, and I pray that in our discourse today, we can revitalize our commitment to peace and at all levels and become a true family that respects each other, helps each other, and works together for the cause of peace. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a number of guest speakers, and I'm delighted to welcome our first guest speaker today, Dame Siobhan McDonough, MP. Good evening, everybody. It's a privilege to be with the Amadi community this evening. 
I am honoured to be around so many friends, community leaders, and most importantly, that His Holiness is able to deliver the keynote speech. The themes for tonight's e event is building a sustainable peace, and we all know that there is only one place to start, and it is with pain and sadness. The pain and sadness of war that has been going on for far too long. It is now 154 days since the appalling war began, and since that day, the killing has gone on. Flattened cities and refugee camps and hostages in chains. I'm sure you are with me in saying that not a day has gone by without being horrified by the images of a war in Gaza. Disease and hunger are rife, with very little aid being allowed to reach those in desperate need. Before the crisis, about 500 trucks a day were getting in, and today the figure is less than 95. The destruction of at least 16 cemeteries add further to the horrors of the attacks in Gaza. I'm no expert in foreign policy, and I'm certainly not the Foreign Secretary, but I can join with everyone here today in saying that we want the agony and the fighting to stop. And what better place to make that plea? The Amadi community has been at the forefront of calling for peace since the very start of the conflict. It is His Holiness who urged all world powers to de-escalate and work towards a lasting, peaceful solution. There is no way out of the crisis without the hope that both Palestinians and Israelis have a path to security, justice, and an opportunity in lands that they can call their own. Hamas and Israeli hardliners want to bury a two-state solution, and we need to show that we will not let that happen. Thank you. Our next guest speaker, is Jonathan Lord, MP. Your Holiness, Mr. President, distinguished guests, assalamu alaikum. On behalf of the residents and communities of Woking and of Surrey, uh, and on behalf of the Conservative Party, I extend my heartfelt congratulations to you on the occasion of the 18th Annual Peace Symposium at this Western Europe's largest and most impressive mosque. Your commitment to promoting peace, justice and tolerance across the world is truly commendable. With the recent rise in Islamophobia and anti-Semitism, I want to extend my heartfelt support and solidarity to you during these very challenging times. It also pains me to know that your community continues to face persecution in Pakistan and around the world. In the face of such uncertainties in the international situation, your holiness and your community have been true beacons of peace, reminding us of the values that should unite us all, the shared belief in freedom, the right to choose, and the freedom to worship. The Ahmadiyya Muslim community's motto of love for all, hatred for none, is truly wonderful and more needed at this time than at many times in the recent past. And it should resonate with people of all faiths, all religions, and those of none. Thank you. Our next guest speaker is the Right Honourable Sir Ed Davey MP, the leader of the Liberal Democrats Party. Assalamu alaikum. Like many of you, I've had the privilege and honour to attend many other peace symposiums here at the mosque. 
and to listen to His Holiness and to work with the Amadi community for peace. That has never been as important as, as it is this year. We see war and conflict across the world. We see it in Sudan. We see it in Yemen. Of course, we see it in Ukraine, and we see it in the Middle East, in Gaza. And we need to redouble our efforts for our country to play its role in bringing an end to these wars and to these conflicts. And that's why we're looking forward to the keynote speech of His Holiness tonight. When it comes to what's happening in Ukraine, it is with fear and foreboding that we approach the next few weeks and months as the prospect of a further Russian assault on East Ukraine becomes ever more likely. I and uh, my wife uh, host a Ukrainian refugee, a young med medical student from Odessa. And to hear her fear of the future for her country, for, for her, her father who is out there, brings home to you the sheer horror of the war in Ukraine. But of course, all our thoughts in recent months have been with what's been happening in Israel and Gaza. The horror of children being killed, of, of men and women being killed, of course, is, is beyond description. But just thinking of the trauma of those children not being able to be with their mother, those human stories that we, we see and hear of, that should touch our hearts and force us to redouble our efforts. It's why I and my, the Liberal Democrats have called for an immediate bilateral ceasefire four months now. We need that ceasefire so that killing can stop, so the aid can get in, so the hostages can be released, so we can start a peace process that gets to the two-state solution that could be offered. And I'm looking forward to His Holiness' speech to talk about what's happening and how we can play our role, all of us play our role. Thank you. We now come to the presentation of the Peace Prizes, the Ahmadiyya Muslim Prize for the Advancement of Peace, and I invite Mr. Rafi Kayar to introduce the first recipient. <clears throat> Thank you very much. This year, we are presenting two awards for 2020, which, wasn't, uh, which we were not able to present due to COVID, and the prize for 2023. It gives me great pleasure to share with you the 2020 recipient of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Peace Prize for the advancement of peace is Eddie Roach from Ireland. Eddie started her journey in the 1980s with the Irish Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament and devised a peace education program that was delivered to several schools across Ireland. In 1990, she became the first Irish woman elected to the Board of directors of the International Peace Bureau at the United Nations in Geneva, and in 1997 was a candidate for the presidency of Ireland. In 1991, she founded Chernobyl Children's Project International, which gives aids to children who have been deeply impacted by nuclear disaster. The organization raises approximately 1.9 million euros on an annual basis for children in Belarus, Western Russia and Ukraine. We are proud to welcome Adi, who's <clears throat> someone whose work has brought light to people's lives from a very dark situation. We congratulate Adi.
we now invite Adi to say a few words. Salam alaikum from your neighbouring island of Ireland. Your Holiness, esteemed guests, it is my honour and my privilege to become a recipient of the Amadea Award today. And as I stand here, I am reminded of the prophetic words of that wonderful scientist, Albert Einstein, when he said, the splitting of the atom has changed everything except our way of thinking, and thus we drift towards unparalleled catastrophe. These words reveal how Einstein foresaw what would happen on the 6th of August and the 9th of August 1945 on the innocence of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which led to the beginning of what we now call the nuclear arms race and the symbiotic relationship with nuclear power energy. And ultimately, Einstein's words shows that he foresaw what would eventually happen at 1.23 a.m. on the 26th of April 1986, an explosion at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in Ukraine, leading to what the United Nations deemed to be the greatest environmental catastrophe in the history of humanity. And today, in humility, I can only offer you my truth, my witness, and the evidence of my heart. For I know what I have seen and continue to see, so many babies and children with poor health, such neglect and abandonment. And yet I can see such beauty, such innocence, and such potential that I am challenged to act and to reach out and say, here are my helping hands, and here are our sheltering arms, and here are our loving hearts. For it is a privilege to be invited into the life of a child and to be of some benefit to their scarred and broken bodies. And in many cases, it is inter intervened to save a child's life that, my friends, is a rare and special privilege. The power of our humanity is strong, and we can feel it in this room, in this mosque today. Because together, in that spirit of love in action, we can save the world by giving it that transfusion of love and also of hope because we stand together on the side of peace, because we know that the power of our love can overcome the love of power. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. The second presentation this year gives me great pleasure to announce the winner of the 2023 Amdiya Muslim Peace Prize is David Spurdle from the UK. David was a teacher from Haunt Church in the UK when he visited Lebanon in 1983 during the Lebanese Civil War and saw the first hand the suffering of children who were in dire need of help. The charity helps by providing shelter, food, education and health care for children with mixed or in-home support. Where possible and in family homes, where that is only option to give children life chances. Whilst now retired, Mr. Spurtle still has strong links with his charity. The mission and work that, has inspired, that was inspired by him continues to grow today at an international level. Peace and blessings. Just to acknowledge His Holiness and all you 
honoured guests, and to say what a privilege it is to be here this evening. On this incredible journey, I've been joined by outstanding supporters who have stood by me, helping us to rescue over 20,000 children from terrible circumstances. On behalf of our amazing kids, who have overcome unbelievable challenges and triumphed, I humbly receive your award. Thank you very much. It now gives me great pleasure and honour to invite the keynote speaker, His Holiness Hazrat Mirza Masroor Ahmed, the worldwide head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. <clears throat> Bismillahir Rahmanir Raheem. In the name of Allah, the gracious, ever merciful. <clears throat> All distinguished guests, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace and blessing of Allah be upon you all. <clears throat> Today, once again, we have gathered together for this event hosted by the Ahmadiyya Muslim community to discuss and reflect upon how we can bridge division in society and establish genuine peace in the world. For over two decades, I have urged governments, politicians, and all people to play their roles in ensuring social cohesion of our individual societies and the wider peace and harmony of the world. I have expressed my views on how we can bring an end to all forms of warfare, whether conflicts fought falsely in the name of religion or those which are overtly geopolitical. I have not only spoken of the pressing need to end wars between nations, but also to tackle the frustrations that exist locally within communities and to strive for peace in those nations where civil wars or internal disputes are rife. Certainly, history teaches us that internal conflicts can spiral into regional wars, often fueled by the interference and influence of external powers and ferment instability and division in other countries to, to serve their interests. In recent decades, we have witnessed the devastating consequences of such interference in countries such as Kuwait, Iraq, Syria, and Sudan. Above all, I have repeatedly warned that the unjust policies of the major powers and the unfair political, legal, and economic systems that have prevailed in much of the world are triggering an ever-rising tide of inequality in much of the world are triggering an ever-rising tide of inequality, which in turn is fueling global instability and insecurity. Over the years, politicians, intellectuals, or members of the public have invariably agreed with my assertion that we must strive for peace. <clears throat> However, 
Many also expressed their opinion, either directly or indirectly, that I was wrong to believe that existing conflicts could conceivably escalate into a global war and even trigger the use of nuclear weapons. Many considered this to be unnecessarily pessimistic. For a long time, even those intimately engaged in world uh, affairs, such as politicians, foreign policy journalists, or analysts, did not agree with me, either due to their idealism and a desire to look at the world through rose-tinted glasses, or perhaps due to an incapability to learn lessons from history. They seemingly ignored the widening cracks that have been opening up in recent decades in international relations. Perhaps they simply did not wish to accept the reality of what was uh, staring them in the face. As they say, ignorance is bliss. Yet today, as wars rage here in Europe, the Middle East, and elsewhere, many of the same people are now raising the alarm warning of a global war in which nuclear weapons could be used to wreak an unimaginable devastation on the world. Despite this realization, many still seem unwilling to consider what must be done to end these conflicts and remain reluctant to hear the genuine voices for peace that exist in the world. Given this, as I thought about today's event, I wondered whether there was any point in us gathering here again. What benefit was there for us to speak about peace and justice? If those with the power and, power and ability to influence change were determined not to hear us. The stark reality is that even those institutions founded with the primary objective of maintaining the peace and security of the world are becoming increasingly irrelevant. For example, the United Nations has become a weak and almost powerless body where a few dominant nations wield all the power and easily override the views of the majority. Instead of deciding each issue based on its facts and merits, nations have formed alliances and vote according to their self-interest. Ultimately, critical decisions are made by a few privileged nations in whose hands rest the veto power. Instead of faithfully serving the cause of peace and justice, they wield their veto like a trump card wherever their narrow interests are threatened irrespective of whether their decision shatters the peace and prosperity of other nations and leads to the death and destruction of scores of innocent people. Let it be clear, therefore, that where a veto power exists, the scales of justice can never be balanced. Nonetheless, despite these reservations, I realized that I must use this opportunity to speak because Islam teaches Muslims never to waver in the pursuit of peace. It teaches us
to speak the truth so that when held accountable before Allah the Almighty, a believer can truthfully claim to have tried his utmost to save his creation from destruction. Furthermore, the Holy Prophet of Islam, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, has stated that the greatest form of jihad, a term that is consistently misunderstood as and uh, misrepresented, is to speak truthfully and courageously before one's leaders, especially those who are hard-hearted, unjust, and cruel. Certainly, if weaker nations or individuals like myself who have no political affiliation try to speak up, it is rarely appreciated and those who do can face difficulties or risk sanctions. Despite this, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, based on the teachings of Islam, continues and will always continue to strive earnestly in the cause of peace and champion the rights of those who are powerless and are the victims of injustice. We will, God willing, constantly endeavor to use whatever means we have to influence those within our reach, be they politicians, policymakers, intellectuals, and others towards establishing peace in the world. Indeed, some of you may well be aware of the consi uh, consistent efforts our community is making to foster peace and to alleviate the suffering of those who are in grave physical or emotional distress. And so, after these introductory words, I now wish to offer my thought on how to establish peace in the world. As far as religion is concerned, none of the founder of the major religions, whether Prophet Jesus, Prophet Moses, or any other prophet of God, nor the founder of Islam, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, ever taught that their followers to disregard the peace of society and to resort to injustice or aggression. While it is true that in certain extreme circumstances they permitted the use of limited force, it was always exerted solely with the intention of ending warfare and oppression. As for Islam, it, it literally means peace, and every aspect of its teachings reflect this meaning. For instance, in chapter 42, verse 41 of the Holy Quran, Allah the Almighty commands that where a person or nation has been wronged, they must never respond disproportionately or stray into the realm of seeking revenge. Furthermore, Allah says that it is better to forgive if it can lead to reformation. Chapter 49, verse 10 of the Holy Quran says that if two nations are at war, neutral parties should mediate between them and strive to establish peace based on the principles of justice and equity. If having reconciled, one party violates the terms of the agreement and again resort to warfare, other nations should force, uh, forcefully unite against the aggressor until it desists from its aggressive conduct. Once it stops, the other nations must also cease using force. The objective should always remain to build sustainable peace underpinned by justice. It should not be that a third party take advantage of the vulnerability of the warring parties by usurping their rights for his own benefit. 
If this principle were observed at the United Nations and other relevant bodies, conflicts would be resolved far more amicably and swiftly. However, it will prove impossible for true peace to emerge so long as nations, either directly or through their power, uh, powerful allies, can utilize a veto power. Regrettably, due to its uh, inherent lack of justice, the fate of the United Nations seems set to mirror that of its failed predecessor, the League of Nations. And if the system of international law, weak as it may be, completely collapses, the resulting anarchy and destruction is beyond our comprehension. Whilst there are myriad of conflicts taking place in the world, the most pressing and dangerous are those taking place between Israel and Hamas and the ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine. Some people may believe or may have been conditioned to think that uh, the conflict between Israel and Palestine is a religious war. However, in reality, it is a geopolitical and territorial conflict. As for the war in Ukraine, it is very evidently a geopolitical war being fought for territorial reasons. If, uh, I firmly believe there is only one way to end these wars, by ensuring that justice prevails and that whatever settlements are made are based on equity, as opposed to what better serves the interests interest of external powers. Otherwise, there is no benefit to the United Nations or international laws, and the only rule that shall hold weight will be the one that declares might is right. In terms of the Ukraine war, Russia has a veto power at the UN Security Council, whilst in effect Ukraine also has won by virtue of its alliance with those Western nations who have permanent membership of the Security Council. How can a settlement be agreed if both sides can effectively wield a veto? Why would either party be motivated to move even an inch if they know they can veto any deal not weighted entirely in their favor. As for what is happening in Gaza, though both the Israelis and the Palestinians have their supporters, the veto power has only been used in Israel's favor since the current war ignited several months ago. For example, in February, 13 out of 15 members of the UN Security Council voted in favor of an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, but the United Nations utilized its veto, uh, United States utilized its veto power and the resolution was defeated. How can peace be established where the majority view is so easily discarded? That is not justice. Instead, it is a rejection of democracy and principle of equality. Contrary, contrary to these man-made laws, Islam's teachings emphasize justice to such a degree that chapter 5, verse 9 of the Holy Quran states that the enmity of any nation or people must never incite one to deviate from the path of justice and fairness. Manifesting such integrity is nearer to righteousness. Even non-religious uh, uh, non people 
will surely recognize the wisdom and benefit of adopting this preeminent standard of justice. At the same time, you may wonder why, if Islam's teachings are as I am describing, is it often alleged that Islam is an extremist religion? Indeed, indeed this debate has come to the surface again in recent days due to inflammatory and misguided comments by certain politicians. In this regard, it should be categorically clear that the wars and battles fought by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, and his rightly guided successors were entirely defensive. The Holy Quran permitted the Muslims to fight back only as a last resort after they had been mercilessly attacked by the opponents of Islam and been the victims of years of sustained persecution. This permission is enshrined in chapter 22, verse 40 of the Holy Quran, which states that those upon whom war is forced unjustly have a right to defend themselves because they have been wronged and are the victims of oppression and persecution. Moreover, the Holy Quran clarifies that permission to fight back was granted not just to, defeat, to defend Islam, but to defend all religions and to enshrine the principles of freedom of conscience and freedom of belief. Thus, in subsequent verse, Allah the Almighty states that if he did not stop those who transgress by means of others, then churches, synagogues, temples, mosques, and all other places of worship where the name of God is oft recited would be destroyed. Hence, Muslims are commanded to defend and protect all religions and places of worship rather than cause them any harm. Furthermore, wherever the conditions for defensive wars were met, the Muslim armies were governed by stringent rules of engagement given by the Holy Prophet of Islam, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him. Firstly, he stated that wars must never be fought to fulfill personal or vested interests, to conquer lands or to establish supremacy over others. Rather, Muslims were only permitted to fight if war was waged upon them. In the event of war, other nations should unite to stop the aggressor. Once the aggressor ceases to use force, the other nations should immediately end the war and seek to establish lasting peace. In addition, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, strictly forbade targeting civilians, something all too common in the wars being fought in the modern world. Further, he instructed Muslims to ensure the scope of the war remained as limited as possible. All forms of escalation or expansion of the war, both in terms of territory and means, were to be avoided. Islam also teaches that unless one's opponent's opponent uses a place of uh, worship as a military base, it is not permissible to violate the sanctity of a place of worship by fighting within it or even near it. Uh, near it. it is strictly forbidden to knock down or desecrate the places of worship of your opponents. Further, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, forbade the previously common practice of mutilating the bodies of enemy soldiers and instructed that their bodies were to be treated with care and respect. If uh, he also taught that no form of deception 
was permitted in warfare. As already outlined, women, children, the elderly, and other innocent civilians were never to be targeted. Similarly, priests, rabbis, or other religious leaders were not to be harmed or prevented from carrying out their religious duties. The Holy Prophet of Islam, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, also prohibited Muslim soldiers from inflicting any form of terror or fear amongst the general public during wars. Indeed, all non-combatant and civilians were to be treated kindly and no injustice was to be per perpetrated against them. Furthermore, he instructed that Muslim armies should not make base, bases or camps in towns or areas where they would cause anxiety or discomfort to ordinary civilians. He stated that during battle, soldiers should not strike their opponents in the face and should cause them the least possible harm and distress. If prisoners of war were caught, they were not to be separated from their relatives if they too were imprisoned. Additionally, every effort was to be made to make prisoners of war comfortable to the extent that their comfort and needs were to be prioritized over those of the captor. If a Muslim was guilty of any form of cruelty or harshness towards a prisoner of war, they were to release him immediately to make amends. Another instruction of the Holy Prophet, Muhammad, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, was that the, uh, uh, the representatives or emissaries or other nations should be held in high esteem, of other nations should be held in high esteem, and any mistakes or discourtesies on their part ought to be ignored in the interest of peace and harmony. And so these are the basic Islamic rules of war and the Holy Prophet, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, said that if a Muslim violated these principles, it demonstrated that they were not fighting for justice. Instead, they were fighting to inflict cruelty and out of self-interest. Without a doubt, every Muslim nation and government must abide by these Islamic teachings. Setting aside religion, I also believe if non-Muslim nations adopted these principles, then even if wars occurred, they would not, be, uh, not lead to such deep-rooted enmities forming that remained embedded, embedded in, uh, generation after generation. So all nations involved in warfare, be they Western nations, those who harbor enmity for the Islamic world, or Muslim countries, should recognize that peace can only be established if they act upon these principles of warfare and conflict resolution. Otherwise, we lie at the precipice of a catastrophic global war that will undoubtedly lead to such immense levels of destruction and carnage that lie for far beyond our imagination. As I said earlier, many people are now reaching the same conclusion. For example, Professor Jeffrey Sash, a highly respected economist from Columbia University writes, the world is on the edge of nuclear catastrophe in no small part because of the failure of Western political leaders to be forthright about the causes of the escalating global conflicts. He continues, the relentless Western narrative that the West is noble while Russia and China are evil 
is simple-minded simple and extraordinarily dangerous. It is an attempt to manipulate public opinion, not to deal with very real and pressing diplomacy. Professor Sash continues, above all, at this time of extreme danger, European leaders should pursue the true source of European security, not U.S. hegemony, but European security arrangements that respect the legitimate security interests of all European nations, certainly including Ukraine, but also including Russia, which continues to re resist NATO enlargements into the Black Sea. At this stage, diplomacy, not military escalation, is the true path to European and global security. Furthermore, much has been written or spoken about the ongoing war between Israel and Hamas and the grave humanitarian situation in Gaza that worsens by the day. For example, during a recent interview, U.S. Senator Bernie Sanders, who himself is Jewish, strongly condemned the actions of the Israeli government. He said, what Netanyahu Yahu, and his right-wing government are doing right now to the people of Palestine, of Gaza, is indescribable and in unspeakable. I mean, we are looking at 25 to 26,000 people who have been killed already. This, is the, this was the figure when he wrote this or he interviewed. Now this figure has gone beyond this number. Two-thirds of, of whom are women and children. 65,000 65, people have been wounded. We are looking at 70% of the housing units in Gaza have been damaged or destroyed. You are looking at 1.8 million people pushed out of their homes. God knows where they are going. Senator Sanders continued by saying, right now, and I hope everybody hears this, you are looking at the possibility of hundreds of thousands of children starving to death. And we in the United States, through our financial support of Israel, uh, support of Israel are complicit in what, what is happening. And I will be damned if I am going to give another nickel to the Netanyahu government in order to continue this war against the Palestinian people. Asked if and how a settlement could be reached in the Middle East, Senator Sanders said, the history of the region is terrible. It deals with the Holocaust, six million Jews. It deals with the displacement of hundreds of thousands of Palestinians from their homes. But at the end of the day, the Palestinian people are entitled to a homeland of their own. So we are talking about a two-state solution. In addition to the two people I have quoted, many other commentators are now reaching the same conclusion about the critical state of the world I have long warned of. I take no satisfaction in this. Rather, with all my heart, I hope and pray that before it is too late, the world comes to its senses and brings an end to the brutalities and wars taking place in the world. Certainly, it is my opinion that there should be a full ceasefire between Israel and Hamas, or Palestine, and also in the war between Russia and Ukraine. Thereafter, instead of inciting their respective allies towards further warfare, all members of the international community should prioritize ensuring relief effort or stepped up to help those in desperate need and focus on bringing about a lasting and peaceful settlement. If instead 
we stand by and let these wars escalate further, countless more innocent lives will be lost. And surely history will judge us with contempt as the author of our own destruction and misery. And so, in conclusion, if we wish to save our future generation from being born with the ill effects of radiation caused by nuclear warfare and desire to save them from deprivation and desperation, and if we wish to save ourselves from their courses and laments, we, uh, from their curses and laments, we must act with urgency and wisdom. Political leaders and those who have access to policymakers must take a long-term view of what is in the best interest of mankind, rather than being blinded by selfish desires to assert their superiority over others. We must all come together setting aside national, political, and other vested interests for the greater good of humanity and to ensure that we leave behind a prosperous world for our future generations. It is the need of the time that we must focus all our energies and efforts on establishing true peace so that we may live in a world of hope and prosperity rather than a world defined by inequality, hatred, and bloodshed. With these words, I sincerely thank all of our guests for joining us this evening and listening to what I had to say. I apologize for speaking at length, but I felt it necessary to do so given the precarious state of the world. Thank you, and once again, I express my sincere appreciation to you all. Thank you very much. His Holiness was entirely inspiring in talking about how we need to understand each other, how we need to find peaceful ways to fight hate and division, and how we need to avoid another world war where nuclear weapons could ultimately destroy us in our communities. The takeaway message has been something that I've been building on for many, many years. It's basically about peace. I mean, a lot of discussion was about the wars in different countries. But I mean, we we'll all take away, and we should all be taken away daily in our mindset and our behavior and our actions is about peace. You know, you're my brother, you're my sisters, we should be taking care of each other. And I think every human being should have that element of peace in their mind that they're actively working towards peace. I think one of the things he spoke about was um, complacency from a lot of political leaders over the years and the failure to deal with conflicts before they reach this stage of uh, conflict where we have full-scale war. And I think we need to be very watchful of that within our communities, but also within uh, each stage of uh, a territorial invasion. We need to watch that carefully and see if we can go down diplomatic routes sooner than we are, because um, it feels like, in a way, that the two conflicts in the last uh, couple of years that are as big as Ukraine and Israel and Gaza, of course, by surprise, but they really shouldn't have. The, the signs were there for a long, long time. And we're seeing signs even, even within our own communities now with Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. These are things that we need to contain and deal with in a peaceful manner much, much sooner. Our international human rights law is failing us. That's the message I got from his speech, that we're not doing enough as a global international community. And I hope that being a lawyer myself, I can contribute to changing that. I think for me what really stood out is the diversity of faith in the room um, and seeing the leader of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community give an award to a Christian leader who's leading a Christian organization for Christian charitable work to see that level of interfaith and that level of love between the communities was really inspirational you know especially at this time it was raised by numerous of the speakers the the place we're in now with war 
abroad, but also the level of hate here amongst communities is incredibly distressing for everyone. So to see the demonstrations here of interfaith and, and love is, is truly inspirational. Events such as these have an impact in the way they're able to bring people together from across different nations. And it enables conversation to happen in ways that doesn't happen in our day-to-day -day life. And I think it's very important that also uh, we get to know each other because only by uh, knowing each other we also uh, lose prejudgments and also the fears. I'm very pleased to have been invited here tonight and to very much support His Holiness and uh, everything he had to say in his speech. I thought that His Holiness's address was extremely powerful. It was really a tour de force of all the challenges that we're facing across the world in areas of conflict. You know, in essence, I'm sure we all support uh, his aims. And I think the wonderful thing about him is that, that he is about peace. He's not a politician and he will go on and on and on. I thought it's very measured, very, very detailed. Um, a lot of places you go they, around these topics, they are trying to you know, change the subject, they're not very specific. Um, he's very forward, very detailed, he's not missing his words. Peaceful, but was very clear. He wasn't saying, watering things down, which I think is important. I felt very emotional because he is the only leader that I know, or that I've come across, that actually speaks it as it is. He speaks about the dangers of if we we ignore the uh, progression towards making war and more of a nuclear exchange. We ignore it at our peril. And the whole of civilization will pay the ultimate price. And I believe His Holiness has foreseen this in the last number of years. And I think people now are beginning to listen with a new set of ears because they understand that actually his vision of what, unless we bring about peace. So I just love the whole idea of a community being absolutely knitted together with one sole purpose, and that is the creation of world peace. I think uh, the message to the night was very important because especially in today's uh, context, the geopolitical context, it's very important that we have uh, people who advocate for peace. I have always said that uh, it is just two words I have to describe the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, and it's discipline and courtesy. With all the speeches tonight, I felt them very inspirational. Um, they've resonated an awful lot with me, um, and I wish more people could actually hear these type of addresses, because I'd like to think that they'd resonate more with the general public. Um, and perhaps we could start changing people's opinion and how we treat each other.